Hello. Hey there. How's it going? Good. How's it going for you? Pretty good, thanks. Yeah, doing okay. <laughs> um, let's see. So, Chloe, audio and video are looking good. Do you want to try? Yeah. Let well? me let me try to share screen. Cool. Can you see the full screen presentation mode? Yep, that's looking good. There's um, there's some like grayed out boxes. Yes, there. I keep I keep hearing that from people. I just do not know what these are. I think maybe these are like the Zoom widgets coming and going. Ah, could be. Yeah, there's uh, like a, a narrow one at the top and then one in the kind of upper right corner. Yeah, uh, let me. Let me see if I can actually share the desktop from there, maybe. Okay, yeah. I mean, it wasn't really obscuring anything. Like, it wasn't that big of an area, but... You know, like, yeah, people have said that before. I have not been able to figure yeah. out. So can you see my desktop now? Yeah. Okay, so if I do that, if there's... Is it that anybody? Looks, yeah, that's better. I don't see any readout regions there. Oh, okay. Okay, better. cool. Okay, so then I'll I'll just uh, share my desktop then. Okay, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, that's that's strange, but uh, <laughs> as long as that that works, that's good. Yeah. Um, so this see. is a one hour or like what's the duration? So I was planning yeah. to have like thirty five to forty minutes of talk time, and then just let people like. That's ask perfect. Questions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, we have the full hour. Um, so yeah, if you talk for like 40 minutes, if it goes to 45, that's totally fine. Um, and then we'll have time for questions. Occasionally people ask questions kind of during the talk. Um, yeah, that's fine with me. Yeah, and, and if they keep asking too many questions, <laughs> I'll tell them to stop so that it doesn't get too disruptive. <laughs> but um, yeah, and uh, we usually record these talks. Is that okay with you? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Perfect. And um, like we can either keep the recording only visible within Carnegie or make it just sort of findable anywhere. Yeah. Sometimes, sure. okay. Sometimes people have like proprietary data that they don't want to share yet. But... No. So most of the things are uh, already published. So that's fine. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Uh, I think that's everything. So. Okay. Yeah, it usually takes people a minute or two after the hour to actually arrive yeah. anyway. So yeah, I guess uh, during the talk, I won't be able to like see the chat. So if there are questions, maybe you can call out the name or just people yeah. can unmute themselves. Yeah, so often people will just unmute themselves, but I yeah. always monitor the chat anyway in case people okay. are raising their hand or anything. Okay, cool. So no problem. I apologize if there's any background noise. My neighbors, like, I don't know what they're doing, but maybe like, <laughs> there's like jackhammering and stuff going on all day. So it's a little loud, but. Totally understandable. Like I uh, came to the office today because I know my internet in the house sometimes just goes like on and off. So uh, like, these are yeah. just like, you know, <laughs> These are the problems of working from home. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> Hey, Andrew, twinsies. Yeah, I, I can't afford my own t-shirts. I just have to use the Carnegie provided ones, so. Yep, <laughs> three days in a row. <laughs> oh. 
Hi, Dan. Good to see you. Hello, good to see you. Hello, speaker <laughs> Namrata. Nice to meet you. I'm Hi. Nice to meet you virtually. <laughs> yes. Can I give it like another minute here because people are still arriving? Sounds good. Okay, I think we can go get and go ahead and get started at this point. Um, so it's a pleasure today to welcome Namrata Roy um, to join us to give our lunch talk. Um, so Namrata is a grad student um, at UC Santa Cruz, uh, where she works with Kevin Bundy, um, uh, largely making use of data from the SDSS Manga collaboration. Mm -hmm. And her work focuses a lot on understanding supermassive black holes and AGN feedback. And she's going to tell us today about uh, large-scale AGN-driven winds in nearby elliptical galaxies. So now we're going to take it away. Thank you so much. Let me uh, share the desktop as before. Uh, OK, so there are no weird widgets. Looks, looks good, yeah. OK. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, I am Namrata Roy. I am a finishing graduate student at UC Santa Cruz. And first of all, thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk in this uh, virtual uh, lunch talk series. So I will be mostly talking about the research that I have done during my PhD thesis. So it is broadly about feeding and feedback by large scale AGN winds in nearby galaxies. Uh, but more specifically, I shall focus on a unique population of early type galaxies that we call the red geysers uh, that show signatures of gas accretion, feedback, and star formation suppression altogether. And uh, as Andrew already mentioned, I work with Kevin Mundy and the manga collaboration. Uh, so yeah, so let me start. So before I uh, move to the red geyser, so let me take a step back and ask some of the big question. So in the plot in the left, uh, so the y axis shows that out of the total uh, mass function, what's the percentage of mass in the red ended galaxies, which are shown by these red points? And what's the percentage of mass in the blue star forming galaxies shown by these blue points? And how does this mass percentage evolves with redshift? So the x-axis is redshift. Now the different, uh, the three different panels are for different stellar mass bins. But if you just focus on one, so let's say the middle panel or the upper panel, you can see that uh, the percentage of mass in the red and dead galaxies has been increasing steeply from high redshift towards the low redshift. That means that more and more contribution uh, in mass is coming from this red and dead population. Um, so that automatically implies that more and more galaxies are actually transitioning from this blue star forming phase towards the red sequence uh, in the nearby uh, universe. So there are two main questions that arises at this point. Uh, what drives this galaxy's bequest and what stop star formation in these galaxies? And then second, what keeps the galaxy quiescent? So once a galaxy transitions to the red and dead phase, what keeps them in the red and dead phase and prevents uh, residual star formation from uh, happening? So we all know that feedback is essential. 
Uh, there are two types of uh, feedback, uh, the stellar feedback or the supernova feedback, which is mostly uh, prevalent in the lower mass end of the galaxies. And then there is the AGN feedback, which happens, which is more predominant in the massive end of the galaxy luminosity function. Now, this AGN feedback can again come in two different flavors and two different modes. So one of them is the quasar mode or the radiative mode. And the second is the radio mode or the maintenance mode. So majority of my talk will focus on this radio mode feedback. Okay, so what is this radio maintenance mode feedback? So these are generally associated with the central radio AGN. And often these are radiatively inefficient. So these are accreting at a low Eddington uh, rate. And they deposit the energy and momentum through their radio jets. Now, this is of course a classic example of this radio mode. I'm sure everyone here has seen this picture. This is from the famous uh, McNamara and Nelson. Uh, so here you can see there is a radio AGN and then there is this giant radio jets of, uh, of uh, spatial extent of uh, uh, almost like megaparsec, uh, which is shown in red. And these radio jets are clearing the gas and creating cavities in the surrounding ambient medium, uh, the hot gas, which is shown in this kind of blue X-ray observations. But again, this is an example in a cluster. And it has been shown from calculations that, you know, the work done by this uh, radio jets on the ambient media medium, this PV work, it, it is enough to uh, kind of counterbalance the overcooling in these clusters. Uh, but these are in clusters and there are many examples in clusters. But the main question that we have is, are there evidences of radio mode feedback in typical quasi galaxies? That's an important question because, you know, if you want this radio mode to explain the quenching of the galaxy population, we need to be able to explain uh, how this radio mode uh, suppresses star formation in typical red-ended galaxies. So do we see this kind of smaller version of this radio mode uh, jets in uh, galaxies? Turns out, yes, there are evidences that we are starting to see uh, galaxy scale jets. So these, I'm showing some, a very few examples here. And as you can see, the extent of these jets are, are small. It's uh, a few kiloparsec. And uh, these uh, galaxy scale jets have been observed with uh, high resolution radio observations. But then another uh, kind of intriguing observation that have come out from this uh, studies is that a majority, if not all of this uh, radio uh, host, uh, radio jet host galaxies, they are associated with multi-phase gas outflows as well. And there have been many studies uh, that has looked into that. Uh, I have not uh, put all the papers, but only some of the papers. Uh, we are not really sure how uh, these kind of radio jets and multi-phase gas outflows go together. Maybe these radio jets trigger these outflows, or it could also be vice versa. Maybe these outflows uh, trigger some kind of radioactivity. We are not really sure. But we are kind of starting to see some of these correlations between this radio property and the ionized gas, uh, the, the gas property in the ISM. So here I am showing one of the correlations. So the y-axis is the radio luminosity and the x-axis is the width of the emission line that's tracing the ionized gas. So W90 is, a, is kind of like a width. Uh, so you can see that there is a decent amount of correlation that uh, people have found. And you know, this kind of correlations have, have also been observed with flux, like O3 flux, H alpha flux with radio luminosity. Anyway, the bottom line is we are kind of starting to see some kind of uh, radio jets in galaxies and their relationship with the multi-phase gas outflows. But one caveat here is that majority of the studies were done using integrated uh, uh, optical spectroscopy. So we uh, had mostly integrated measurements of this kind of flux, equivalent width, velocity, et cetera, et cetera. And also majority of the studies uh, were kind of done on a few hand-picked sources, like five to 10 really good examples, but then it could not be explained as a population. 
And so this is where my research comes in. So uh, with that- when Excuse me, can I quickly ask before you move on, what about the three or four red lines in that diagram? Oh, let me see. Oh, so these actually, so these, uh, this plot was actually showing something else. It was showing the different, as you can see, like the, uh, the, the blue and the, uh, this, uh, this black lines and this yellow line. So these were populations that were selected in different ways. And they were trying to fit like different lines and uh, see that, that these kind of best fit lines were not straight lines. It was kind of like this curvy lines that goes through them. Uh, but they were trying to show like the different populations, like the difference in different populations that arise due to the selection effects. Um, but uh, the main point was this kind of correlation. Okay, thank you. Uh, and also, this was not this was not my plot. Just to uh, make it clear, this was uh, uh, some earlier paper. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, so with the advent of uh, you know SDSS manga, like uh, really large optical eye view surveys, uh, it is now possible to look at spatially resolved. Uh, information from these galaxies. So Manga uh, has given us uh, spatially resolved data for 10,000 galaxies. And just to note that Manga data is all public now. So all of Manga data became public uh, last December. So you can just go and download the data and play with it. And so uh, using Manga data, now we have a spectra from each part of the galaxy. So instead of getting one integrated emission line or one integrated velocity, we now have a map of every single quantity that we like. And using Manga data, we have been able to identify and uh, find this uh, unique population of uh, red and dead quiescent galaxies that we call the red geysers. And these galaxies show large scale ionized outflows and they also show suppressed star formations. So I will explain those two points that I just said uh, in the next slides, but let me first show you how they look like. So this is what they look like. Um, so the, the heat maps are the, this yellow kind of contour, this, uh, this map in the, in the middle panels show examples of red geysers. So these are showing the spatially resolved maps of ionized gas as traced by H alpha. And you are seeing this kind of bisymmetric or biconical pattern that extends across the whole galaxy. And this is the characteristic feature of the red geysers. And now if you just look at the optical image that I'm showing in the left, you can see that uh, these are perfectly spheroidal galaxies. There is nothing special going on in them if you just look at the optical image. It's only when you, you know, put on your manga glasses and look with an IFU data, you kind of see this unique patterns in the emission lines and kind of like realize this is a interesting population. So uh, uh, right now we have about 140 or 150 red geysers in our sample. And I should mention this was from an earlier data release. So we have not looked at the current all 10,000 galaxies. Um, so there are more red geysers there. We just haven't looked for it. And uh, we have uh, written a series of papers on this and I'm just going to talk about some of the papers that I have, uh, lead, uh, that I have mostly written as a lead author and uh, very briefly going to some of the results. So that brings me to the outline slide. So first I will talk about some of the AGN properties of these red geysers using radio data. And then I'll talk about uh, some of the multi-phase gas uh, activities in, the, in this ISM. So first I'll talk about the ionized gas component and I'll show you that this ionized gas actually shows outflows along this kind of traced by this bisymmetric pattern. And then the third, I will show uh, some of the cool neutral gas, what they're doing. And we will show that it's actually showing inflows rather than outflows. So very interesting. So let me start with the AGN properties. So we were, uh, you know, we were wondering if these could be, as I said in the beginning, if these could be possible candidates for radio maintenance mode feedback in typical galaxies. So that's the question that we are going for. In order to answer that, that question, we first have to find if these galaxies have radio AGNs in the center. 
So in order to uh, in order to look for that, we looked at the VLA first radio continuum data. So first gives you radio images at 1.4 gigahertz frequency. So we took the red geyser sample and we uh, constructed a matched control sample by matching in uh, you know, standard properties like color, stellar mass, redshift, axis ratio, morphology, et cetera. And then uh, we stacked the radio flux. So this is the plot that we got. So the y-axis shows the stacked radio flux and the x-axis shows the different sample that we stacked on. So the all means that we have stacked on all the red geysers, all the control sample and the radio non-detections uh, signifies we have stacked only the ones which are not bright in the radio, which are not individually bright. So we want, just wanted to be sure that our results are not driven by outliers. We are, our results are not driven by extremely bright uh, uh, sources. So of course the red is for red geysers, the blue is for control galaxies, and the yellow is again control galaxies because those are controlled to have more ionized gas in them so that we could just compare apples to apples with the red geysers. So anyway, the takeaway point for this plot is that irrespective of how you do your stacking, how you select your sample, whether you do it all, whether you just take the non-detections, the red geysers always show enhanced radio flux compared to the control sample. So the red point is always above the blue and the yellow points. And in this I paper- I think there was a question from yeah. Fari. Yeah. So Namrata, quick question. When you say control here, is it uh -huh. controlled by mass or what yeah. is it? Yeah, so it is controlled by color, stellar mass, redshift, axis ratio. And okay. these are also, yeah, and these are also a morphological, uh, morphologically spheroidal. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so these are all integrated properties that we matched with. Yeah, so we always find this enhanced radio flux in this red geysers. And in this paper, uh, uh, we say that uh, we confirm that these are coming from central radio AGNs. And the average luminosity that we find is about 10 to the 22 to 10 to the 23 watts per hour. So these are kind of at the lower luminosity end of the AGN population. But of course, so uh, presence of central radio mode AGNs. But you can ask, well, how do you confirm that these are not coming from star formation? So for that, we, uh, we, uh, we of, of course, these are all red and dead galaxies. These do not show emission lines. They do not show, they have a very high D4000. But aside from that, let us just assume uh, by some miracle, all these radio emissions are coming from star formation. Then what's the amount of star formation we would expect? So that's shown by this plot. So this is a calibration plot uh, between uh, the radio luminosity and the corrected H alpha line. And you can get a star formation rate from this H alpha. Uh, and I just said that the luminosity that we detect is about 10 to the 23 watts per hertz. And that would correspond to a star formation rate of a few solar mass per year. The amount of star formation rate we actually observe is less than uh, 0.01 solar mass per year. So the, these two plots I am showing star formation rate versus stellar mass for the red geysers shown in red. And the background, those uh, kind of uh, gray contours are all manga galaxies. And uh, there are two plots because I have used two different uh, catalogs, two different ways to measure the star formation rate. So one of them uses GALAX, like UV, optical, infrared, and another only uses optical and infrared. And you can see that the red geysers, they have a very low star formation rate in, in both this kind of plots. So we do not have those that amount of star formation rate that would have occurred if this radio emission was coming from star formation. And in addition to that, as I said, these are all completely quenched galaxies. We do not see any emission lines, no UV light, things like that. Okay, so we are pretty convinced these are coming from radio agents. So the next question we ask is, what's the morphology of this radio emission that we are seeing in these galaxies? So for that, we looked at the LOFAR data. So LOFAR 
looks at radio continuum images at uh, a much lower frequency, so about 150 megahertz or so. So you could kind of uh, look at uh, you know uh, things which are at have a much lower spectral indices. And the LOFAR is also uh, very sensitive to low surface brightness features. So you could really capture the total morphology. And as you can see, we found a wide diversity in morphology, starting from compact to slightly extended to these large scale double-sided lobes. And I should mention that these black horizontal lines I should have annotated, but these correspond to about 10 kiloparsec. So you can see that this is pretty gigantic. But uh, after kind of looking at the whole sample, we found that uh, the red geysers mostly show either compact or slightly extended like that. But then I wanted to point out that the beam size or the spatial resolution of the LOFAR data we used was about six arc second, I believe. So six arc second. So the beam size is pretty huge. So it's probably you know, blending some of the smaller scale radio structures that we are seeing. And if I can show you that galaxy scale jet plot in here in this uh, bottom left, you'd, uh, you'd remember that the extent of these was about two or three kiloparsecs. So these were taken with high resolution radio observation with sub arc second resolution. So if we could follow up some of these uh, compact sources, we would expect to see some smaller scale radio jets. But again, we do not have that high resolution radio data, um, uh, but you know, uh, that's a possibility. So that has been explained in this paper, Roy et al. 2021C. This paper actually has uh, a lot of other interesting results. So let me talk about that a little bit. So one of the plots that I really like is this plot. So this is the luminosity, radio luminosity versus size, the radio size that you measure. So the different colored contours that I have shown here are the different radio agents which are compiled from the literature. So for example, we all know the FR1 and FR2 sources, which are this kind of large scale radio jetted ones. So they have a lot of, they, their size is huge. So they kind of occupy the largest uh, size and also kind of large luminosity areas. For example, this one's the gigahertz big spectrum and compact steep spectrum. These are the ones which are kind of compact, but they have a very high radio luminosity. So they can kind of occupy these upper positions. The red geysers, however, uh, shown by these uh, black stars, they occupy this region. Only two or three of the red geysers really have those kind of large scale structures, but majority of them, they occupy this region, which is sometimes called the FR0 type or the compact morphology type. And this is the class of radio AGNs, which are uh, shown to have you know, compact structures when observed in low resolution radio data. But then when they're uh, looked at through high resolution radio data, they are sometimes seem to have this kind of smaller scale uh, radio jets. Uh, and these are sometimes called frustrated jets because they cannot extend beyond a certain region because of the density. Anyway, so this FR0 class has been uh, talked about and has been discussed in the literature a lot. And I think these red geysers are mostly kind of FR0 type radio morphology. And there might be smaller scale jets within. Okay, uh, kind of the, some of the final results about uh, before I move on to optical properties. So we also calculated the jet mechanical energy assuming there is a jet underneath uh, from the radio luminosity. So that's the Y axis here. And the X axis is the black hole mass that we calculated from the velocity dispersion in the center. And so if you just ignore the different uh, colors here, uh, all of these are red geysers, by the way, can clearly see that there is a correlation, there is a rough correlation between the radio luminosity or the jet mechanical energy versus the black hole mass. And this is kind of reiterating the point that if this was not coming from the central EGN, if it was coming from something else like star formation, uh, we would not expect the radio to be correlated with the black hole mass. And uh, we also uh, looked at the Eddington ratios and we found that these are very low Eddington ratio objects. So uh, the, it's about 10 to the minus three to 10 to the minus four. 
so this is kind of in agreement with what we'd expect in a radio mode feedback to happen. And then finally, I also wanted to show a plot uh, that kind of shows this uh, correlation that I was talking about in the introduction that, uh, you know, if we just look at the integrated ionized uh, gas O3, we also, the red geysers also kind of so show this uh, rough correlation between radio and O3 properties. Is there a question? Yes, I think so. Hi, yeah. So I just, before you moved on mm -hmm. from the radio stuff, yeah. I wanted to ask if you've looked at the spectral index maps of these sources, is that something you have available? I do not. We uh, plan on actually writing a VLA proposal uh, for doing that. I did not actually get to do that because I'm not a radio expert. Like I have learned to work with radio data, but uh, I needed uh, to collaborate with someone, uh, you know, for that. So it actually never happened. And I was kind of wrapping up this result. So, but that's something that we wanted to do. We did, uh, we did have some integrated spectral measurements, but um, uh, at least for the ones which are radio jets, we could look at, you know, the central spectral index versus the lobes. Um, but, uh, you know, not some good maps that I can show. Okay, cool. Yeah, it would just be interesting to see that and then try to estimate the ages of these. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what our idea was. Uh, and we actually submitted a GMRT proposal for that, uh, uh, but again, collaborated with a group. And um, yeah, I think that got stuck because there was some problem with the radio data reduction and things like that, which I do not know how to do. <laughs> There's always problems with radio reduction. <laughs> yeah. So. But yeah, that's something that I'm really interested in. I think there's one more question. Yeah. Also. Hi, I think it's me. Uh, I'm Dan. Uh, I'm intrigued by your plot on the right because I'm and uh, new to thinking broadly about these emission lines. And mm -hmm. I was curious if if O3 to O2 is supposed to be related to the ionization in a very strong way. I was yeah. curious if you looked at the the radio emission versus what at least what we think the ionization in some line ratio like O3 to O2 might be? Yeah, so I have I have not particularly plotted or like or 1.4 gigahertz versus O3 by O2, but I have looked at different lines and how this kind of correlation changes. Uh, seems like this correlation is, this kind of like straight line thing is always there irrespective of what, whether I choose H alpha, O3 or O2, uh, even N2 actually. Uh, but I have not looked at how the line ratios look uh, in terms of radio. So that's something that can be done pretty quickly and I can do that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, so I am done with most of my radio results. So let me move on to some of the uh, optical properties. Okay, so I have picked uh, one red geyser as an example, just to kind of show you some of the properties. Uh, so uh, first of all, as I said, uh, these uh, in the, if we just look at the SDSS image, they all look pretty spheroidal and elliptical galaxy. Um, now all of them show this kind of signature pattern, this bisymmetric pattern, which is extended throughout the whole galaxy. And uh, here again, I'm showing this uh, H alpha map. Now the major axis of this ionized gas they roughly aligns with the gas velocity gradient. So here in the bottom left, I'm showing the gas velocity map. Um, so uh, it shows redshift on one side, blue shift on the other with the major axis aligned with this kind of ionized gas. So which means that the gas, uh, majority of the gas is uh, you know, distributed in this direction along this axis. And it's either moving in a rotating fashion like this, or it's moving in an outflow like that, like in a bifold fashion, because both of these scenarios can produce this kind of 2D velocity structures. But then we spend a lot of time thinking about this kinematics and see whether these are winds or disks. So let me point out some of the things, uh, some of the evidences here. So if you now look at the stellar velocity, uh, the gas and the stars are misaligned. So that means, the gas and the stars, they're at least not moving together in a co-rotating or counter-rotating disk. It, they can still be a disk, but it's, uh, they are not, they are kinematically decoupled. Now, if you look at the magnitude of the gas velocity, you can see that the velocity goes up to 250, even 300 kilometers per second in some portion of the velocity field. 
And uh, this is compared to barely 40 or 50 kilometer per second in the stars. And this is something that a disk would have really a hard time to, uh, uh, to kind of uh, uh, satisfy this uh, because uh, the velocity is just too high to be produced by a gravitationally rotating disk. And we actually did some jam modeling. So which is some dynamical modeling where you can uh, model, uh, we can estimate what's the gas velocity can be if it is moving in under the rotation, under the gravitational potential of the stars. And we saw that the gas velocity could not be this high. This is way higher than what jam modeling could predict. And on top of that, uh, there are high gas velocity dispersions that we see. So all the evidences seem to point that these are not disks. These cannot be disks. These are outflows. But you know, we would have been 100% sure if we had some you know, dumb way of looking into the detailed velocity profiles. So something like this, where we could look at this broad components, whether it has wings or things like that, because those are really hard to produce in a, uh, in a disk. But you know, Manga data uh, has a spectral resolution of about 2000 or 2000. So this is not possible to do with Manga data. So in order to do, do that, we actually took the help of Keck data. So we took some Keck ESI data of some follow-up red geysers. We placed the Keck ESI slit on top of this bisymmetric pattern that I'm showing by these contours, black contours. So we placed the slit along that. And then we extracted spatially resolved spectra along that slit. So we could get some velocity profiles along the slit. And uh, Keck ESI, of course, have much higher spectral resolution. As you can see, R is about 8,000, which is about four times higher than Manga. OK, so uh, now we have the spatially resolved spectra. Before I show you what the spectra looks like, let me first show you what our model predicts. So we constructed a toy wind model, so which is basically a bicone. And it's filled with gas particles. And these are all moving radially outward. And they, they had some constraints on the density and the luminosity, depending on what we actually observe in the data. And then we also constructed a toy disk model where you have particles just moving in a rotating disk. And we constructed those two models and we projected them along the line of sight and we extracted spatially resolved velocity profiles along the same locations in the galaxy as the slit. So, we have uh, velocity profiles from the model in the same spatial locations in those different spatial bin as we have data. So we can just make like a one-to-one -one mapping of velocity profile from map model and velocity profile from data. And this is what the model predicts. So the different rows here, so the different rows, as you can see, these are velocity profiles extracted from the different spatial bins as you march down the slit from one side to the other. So, and these are color coded by velocity. So you can just make a one-to-one -one comparison. So this bottom row shows the velocity profile from this bottom most spatial bin. And as you go, go up, you are having velocity profiles along the slit. So as you go up, you go up. Anyway, the takeaway point for this model prediction is that the wind models predict a lot of asymmetry and they predict a lot of wings that you are seeing. And not only that, there is a systematic way in which the wings are kind of shifting. So you can see that there is a wing on the right side in the blue shifted part, and then it starts becoming symmetric, and then the wing is on the other side. The disk model, however, cannot produce this because of just the geometry of the rotating disk. It does produce a little bit of asymmetry, but it's nothing compared to what we actually see in the wind model. Now let me show you what the observation looked like. So here, I'm showing you spectra from two different stack cells or two different spatial bins. And as you can see, they're blue shifted part. It has a wing. It has a very prominent wing in the positive direction. And the wing on the, the profile on the other side shows a wing on the other side. And this is exactly what the wind model predicted. And now I am showing you all the spectra. So it's a little crowded, so I did not want to show you it before. So there are wings here, and then it starts becoming symmetric, and then it becomes asymmetry on the other direction. So yeah, so in this paper, we actually convinced that uh, the line asymmetries that we are seeing, these are consistent with winds, and it cannot be produced by a disk. So we are pretty convinced that these are all winds that we are seeing. 
Okay, so I think we are done with the ionized component. So let me now move on to the cool neutral gas, which is the another phase of the gas that we are proving. And if you have questions, I have, uh, yeah. One more question. Yeah. So, Nrada, uh, before you move on to the inflow part, yeah, I was just wondering uh, what would it look like if you normalize the plot you showed with the uh, velocity map by say the no you know the escape velocity of at, at the local whatever location is the, is the wind escaping or i would i would guess not but i don't know do you know oh so your question is are the uh, are the uh, gas particles escaping the galaxy yeah because you showed that the amplitude is about what 250 or 300 kilometers per second but what is the escape velocity at those different locations yeah uh, so we calculated like uh, we calculate the escape velocity, and it seems like only like ten to fifteen percent of the of the gas can only actually escape. So majority of the gas cannot escape the whole galaxy. So they okay. are they are there. They cannot escape. They are either okay. coming in, coming back down or they're just lying there. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I think Francois has a question as well. Hi. Uh, Hi. Uh, in your nice toy model that we showed before the observations. Yeah the central line had a red bump, which to me is, is a bit surprising because if you're talking of outflow, so the dark blue line in the middle has a bump. Oh, now I see, but the main peak is outflow to the, to the negative velocities. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I should mention that the disk model also creates some asymmetry, but it's just not that as as much as what we see in the data, uh, and it's not what we see in the wind model. And there are uh, there were other things that we had to consider, like beam smearing and things like that, which can like produce some of the broadening effects. So yeah, we dealt with that, and this was kind of the the final uh, profiles. Okay, so if there are no more questions at this point, let me move on to kind of my final uh, result on the gas properties. So. We actually found that in addition to all this ionized gas that we are seeing, we actually see quite a lot of cool neutral gas as well. So here I'm again showing just four random red geysers. Uh, they are not selected in any way, by the way. These are just four red geysers uh, that I'm showing. So these panels are uh, the SDSS images. Uh, the middle panels are those ionized gas by symmetric pattern that I was showing you in the beginning. Uh, uh, all this while. And then the right green panels now show the sodium D, the sodium doublet absorption that is tracing the cool neutral gas. So first of all, there are two observations. The first is that there is a lot of sodium D in these galaxies. As you can notice, there is a lot of sodium D. And then the second is that the spatial position where the sodium D is lying is spatially offset from this kind of ionized gas component. So the cool neutral gas and the ionized gas, they are not occupying the same regions. Those are spatially offset, which kind of automatically tells you that they are probably tracing different activities in these galaxies. But now there is one caveat. This sodium D uh, also has some stellar component in the spectra. So the sodium D can also come from old evolved stars. And of course, it has a huge uh, com contribution from the cool neutral gas in the ISM. So we really have to model out the stellar part to, uh, to be left behind with the ISM only component. And these are using the resonant doublet uh, lines as you have imagined. So in order to actually remove this stellar component, we had to do some detailed stellar population modeling. And I'm only showing that because it took you know, a decent amount of my time to actually do that, uh, we had to make sure that we are not overestimating or underestimating the amount of cool neutral gas from the sodium D. So we used PPXF, we tried different stellar models, stellar templates, and just to kind of see what's the margin uh, of errors that we are getting. And anyway, bottom line is uh, in this bottom right plot, you can see the red line signifies the sodium D coming from the stellar uh, contribution. And then whatever is left behind 
whatever you get by subtracting the black from the red or the red from the black is the residual ISM. So that's the cool neutral gas only sodium D. And you take that and then you model that with the traditional Rupke et al. doublet absorption line model. And that's where you get things like kinematics, covering fraction, equivalent width, things like that. So that's what I have done. So now let me move on to some of the results. So the first result we got is the red geysers have a lot of sodium D, but that's not striking. What we saw is that the radio detected red geysers have the highest amount of cool gas compared to non-radio detected red geysers or compared to control sample. And here is the cumulative probability distribution plot to show that. Uh, so the red, the red line here shows the radio detected red geyser sample and their uh, uh, distribution of the sodium D. And the, the other, uh, so the, the orange line shows the non-radio detected red geysers and the blue and the cyan, they, they show the control sample. So you can see that the radio detected, the distribution of sodium D equivalent width for the radio detected is completely different from the other distribution. And the second is that they have a larger wing in the positive equivalent width direction. So they have a much higher equivalent width. So the, the mean of the distribution is here and it's way higher than what you are predicting in the other sample. So anyway, so physically what it means is that the one, the red geysers, which are radio detected, seem to be having more cool gas uh, reservoir in the ISM for some reason. And this is very intriguing, right? So this is uh, very interesting. We wanted to know what the cool gas is doing kinematically. So, uh, okay, so I forgot there was this, another plot. So I'm just now showing this four, same four examples of sodium D as I was showing before, but now the stellar component has been removed. So now what you are, what you are looking at is just the ISM component of the sodium D. And as you can see, there is a lot of ISM here. But now the next thing that we wanted to know is how this cool neutral gas is flowing. What's the velocity, what's the kinematics? So for that, as I said, we had to model those ISM com component of the spectrum with some models and we got back the kinematics in every spec cell. And this is what we show, uh, we, th this is what we found. So now here I'm showing the spec cell by spec cell velocity map. Now you can see that the majority of the spec cells show red shifted compared to the systemic velocity. So redshift means uh, a positive velocity of about 40 to 50 kilometers per second. And in absorption, actually, redshift means inflow. And this is a technique called down the barrel technique because you are looking down on the, on the absorption, whatever is causing the absorption line lies in, in between the observer and the galaxy in the background. So if that, those particles, whatever is causing this uh, absorption lines is moving into the galaxy, it's inflowing, it will be moving away from you. So redshift actually means inflow. So we actually detect quite a lot of inflow in these galaxies in general. But you know, uh, in order to find this kinematics, we had to take, uh, to take into account some models, right? So we had to model. So what if we wanted to measure the kinematics in a model independent way? So the way to do that is you stack all the sodium D signal coming from the radio detected red geysers. You stack all the signal coming from the non-radio detected red geysers and also you stack the signal from the control sample and see what's their net result in velocity that you are seeing. So that would be kind of uh, indicative of their global nature. And as you can see, the red line shows the stacked sodium D signal from the radio detected red geysers. And you see there is a clear, so the scale is actually pretty huge. It's like 500. So this velocity is about roughly a V of about plus 50 kilometers per second. And this is exactly what we found on a spatially resolved way. So we see a strong inflow signature in the radio detected red geysers, which we do not see in the other samples. So our hypothesis is that uh, maybe this cool, some of this cool neutral gas that we are seeing to be enhanced in this radio uh, host uh, red geysers 
they are probably inflowing and maybe some of them is playing a role in fueling the central radio mode agents and keeping it active. So maybe that's the connection that we are seeing. But of course, that's a hypothesis. This fueling uh, hypothesis is totally uh, not, cannot be confirmed by only Manga data. We need some more higher, either spatial resolution uh, data from some ground-based AO system or things like that. But we do not have that data, but this is just a hypothesis. So that was the point of this Reutel 2021B paper. So yes, so the radio detector red geysers, they not only have a lot of sodium D, they, they also have inflowing cool gas. So that was the point of this paper. So now here I'm kind of showing a schematic diagram of kind of summarizing everything that I have said. So we think that there is a central radio mode AGNs, which are mostly compact as of now, but there might be some smaller structures within. They have ionized gas, which are probably tracing these winds or outflows. And then we are also detecting some inflowing cooler gas by sodium D, which are either coming from outside or it may be a part of this wind, uh, which is recycled and it's just raining back down. And uh, these are some of the papers that uh, I have written. I should also mention that there is another paper that should come out pretty soon where we have looked at the H1 neutral gas content in the red geysers. And again, we found quite a lot of H1 gas compared to the control sample. So very interesting. Okay, so let me see how much time. Oh, I have spent quite a lot of time. Okay, so I, I had one slide about uh, some of the things that we were trying by simulations, but bottom line is it's pretty hard to do. Uh, it's pretty hard to simulate red geysers, uh, but uh, we were trying it using isolated galaxy simulations, but maybe uh, it could be done using cosmological simulations. But really, uh, this, uh, this project did not uh, go as planned. We could not, we were not very successful. There are many, many more things to do about red geysers. For example, as I just said, if we could look at some of these compact structures with higher spatial resolution radio data, we could probably detect some of these radio jets. And it has been detected in the past, uh, some of these works that I have already shown. So we really need uh, to have some VLA expert just saying that, uh, Namarata, I want to write a proposal with you. Um, yeah, so there is Erosita data that's coming up, and uh, I have looked at some of the initial passes of the data, but not very carefully. So I am guessing not these these red geysers would not be very uh, bright in X-rays, but still I wanted to see how many of them are detected in X-rays. So that's something that also have to be have to do. And then finally, uh, we have to, I think one of the things that we could not do with Mongo data again due to the spatial resolution issue is kind of uh, map the detail ionization structure. And there have been some work that have seen, you know, bicone uh, ionization structure, shocks, et cetera, et cetera. But these were all done with Muse AO. Uh, so with Manga, we do not have that kind of spatial resolution. And just for fun, I, uh, you know, deconvolved one of those Muse uh, uh, line ratio maps with the Manga resolution. Turns out this is what it would look like with Manga. So no surprise there, we do not find anything with Manga's BPT, but we really need some high resolution data. I'm going to skip this another project that I recently started, and I just wanted to end with this really cool simulation or, uh, of this uh, video that I found of JWST. Of course, uh, we are all looking forward to JWST and what uh, it will uncover. Um, I'm very excited about it, and I'm also looking to kind of move on from Red Geyser to some other uh, projects related to JWST. I know many people here at Carnegie has uh, JWST approved uh, proposals. So yeah, so I'm very looking forward to what we will uncover using uh, this telescope. Uh, so yeah, just want to end on a, with a, a cool animation video. So thank you. Great, thank you, Namaza. Um, we still have plenty of time for questions. I know we've had a few already, but uh, let's see, Fari, you have another question? Um, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, that was really, really fascinating. Uh, I was wondering if you could go back to uh, the beginning of your, one of your beginning slides when you showed uh, where the red geysers are situated on the star forming main sequence. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, so let me... 
Yes. Um, yes, this one. So yes. uh, I do agree that, you know, looking at this, the one on the top right, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a, the overwhelming majority of these galaxies are indeed on the, on the you know, on the red uh -huh. sequence, right? Uh -huh. But I did notice that, you know, a few of them are actually kind of still on the low end, so to speak, yeah. of, the, of the blue cloud, of the yeah. star forming uh, part of the diagram. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if there's anything special about them. Yeah, so actually some of these are definitely, you know, it's a part of the selection effect also. Like we did uh, include a lot of like uh, conditions and properties just to make sure these are not, these do not have obscure star formation. But yeah, uh, to address that question, we actually also stacked uh, some of this radio by, uh, you know, uh, excluding some of these ones. Uh, and we still found that result. Uh, but yeah, if anything is special in them, uh, as far as I remember, no. Uh, these were all selected uh, in the same condition, like using those kind of bisymmetric feature. Uh, they are all very red in color, uh, in the color space. Uh, they have this kinematics that I showed, very similar kinematics and ionization, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so I, I don't remember anything special going on, but it might be just like a selection thing. Okay, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, I was just wondering, perhaps, you know, the reason that, you know, so they are all quite red, right? Yeah. As you mentioned, they are all red. I was wondering whether um, the reason they are highly star forming has anything to do with, I don't know, recent um, minor major events or something, not enough to change the morphology of the galaxy. Yeah, but maybe. Yeah, that, that is a very uh, good point. Yeah, it, can, it could be. We actually looked at signatures of companion or merger signatures in general for the sample. We did not find that to be uh, like a major factor. Like we did not, there are some galaxies that might reside in groups or some that might have a companion, but like it was not the general trend. So it was definitely not, not uh, true for all the galaxies. So. Uh, maybe the ones, as you were saying, maybe the ones which have more star formation, they maybe those are special. But yeah, nothing that that actually that came to my eyes. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Francois, you had a question? Yes. Um, one thing that is surprising when one sees the images from manga, the direct images that you always have in the left column, uh -huh. that there's very little structure. So they look like the traditional, your boring red ellipticals. Yes, yet, yes. Yet it has been known for many years in the early 80s, people started discovering on higher resolution images that many ellipticals have dark lanes from dust yes. out and so on. And so my question is, if really there are these inflows, you would actually expect these galaxies to have such perhaps finer detailed dark lanes. Have you looked at HST images of your objects or whatever higher resolution images you may have? Uh, we do not have HST images, but I did look at some of the DESI images that came out. And uh, some of these galaxies, uh, they do not show dust lanes, but some of them show some like weird, like, like, you know, some like they are still elliptical, but like, you know, some of them might have some protruding things that are coming out and, you know, it might be like they are a little disturbed, but it was not really very sure. Like I looked at them, it didn't look any different. We definitely didn't, didn't see any dust lanes. And I should also mention that I actually, we actually, uh, you know, removed those kind of dusty looking galaxies just to be sure that we are not including anything that, you know, that are producing stars or they have some star formation just to have a very clean sample to work with in the beginning. Because we were, uh, you know, uh, trying to make uh, the point that these do not have, you know, those disks or disturbed disk in our contamination in our sample. So we were trying to be very conservative in our cut. So. We, uh, so yeah, so these do not show those kind of dusty structures, dusty lanes or disks. If I may follow up with it, what's the average redshift? My impression is I'm there nothing like nearby ellipticals like, you know, Fornax A, which of course has dust lanes, is a radio galaxy. How, what's the mean redshift of your sample? So yeah, so the mean redshift is about 0.03 to 0.05. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
things are getting harder to see by 0 0.03 redshift or say average 0.04 yeah uh, you you would have to have pretty high resolution images to see yeah. lanes that in nearby objects are much more visible yeah yeah we should have applied for some hst time really but uh yeah we do not have hst data at this moment good snapshot program any more questions um I do have another one if there is no other taker at the moment. Okay, no so Namrata, I was wondering if you could show um, the plot, the the, um, the IFU plot where you showed the in evidence for the inflow. Uh-huh, let me pull that out. Um, okay, can you see that? Yes, I can see them clearly. Thank you. Yeah, so what I noticed from here is that they are not necessarily centralized. That you know, uh, the 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 hot regions where you see a lot of you know gas consistent with inflowing gas, they're not necessarily uh, centralized. And so I I just wonder, uh, you know, when you say that this could be. Um, directly feeding the radio nucleus, then I would expect them to be more centralized if, if, if it's directly feeding that. Um, so I was just wondering whether uh, there could be alternative explanations for this. Yeah, so that's a very good question. I, uh, I should also mention that again here, to actually get this kinematic maps, we were being very conservative with the actual modeling. Uh, from the stars versus the extracting the ISM, because in the centralized location, there are also many more old stars. So we were being very conservative and there are spaxels we just threw out information just because we were not sure if it's if it's at the borderline, like if the ISM is, you know, coming from the ISM or is it just like within error bars coming from the stellar populations. So you see there are some spaxels which is just white. That's because we think we thought that those are just their signal to noise might not be that high enough. But of course, if I just, you know, loosen the signal to noise cut a little bit, you, you start seeing many more spaxels. And as I said, ma like majority of the spaxels are red shifted. So if you don't, if you see a spaxel to be white, it doesn't mean there is no gas there. It's just that we were being very strict about the criterion to get those cooler gas extracted. Uh, but yeah, I do agree. There can be other explanations. Uh, also, uh, these do not have to directly feed uh, the central agent. Like the, I, we don't really know that if that's happening, it could also be you know some sort of gas just kind of trickling in, like inflowing. But it does not. I don't know how that will work. But like, uh, yeah, it does not. It not necessarily mean that. I did not mean to say that these are directly going into the central agent because this is hard to kind of like confirm, right? Um, so yeah, but bottom line is we on statistical level, we see inflowing gas uh, more on the radio detected red geysers and we couldn't think of anything else that could have this correlation. So that's that's the point. Uh, but yeah, I did try to kind of make that signal to noise cut a little bit kind of loose. And we did see many more spaxels with uh, redshift, but it's just, I did not put that on the paper because I wanted to kind of make sure that we are doing the right thing. Okay, great, thank you. All right, any last questions? If not, then let's thank Namrat again for a really nice talk. And thanks everyone else. Great. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that was great. Very nice. And I think you are meeting with 